live from the Heartland. This is Tom Clark along with Michael James, and we are pleased to welcome to our microphones Julie Ganey, who is Education Director for Lifeline Theater, a 35-year institution in Rogers Park, but a unique theater company in how they do their craft, which we're going to get into a little bit. But our reason for bringing Julie on this morning is that Lifeline Theater, which is right over at Glenwood Avenue between Farwell and Morris, is in the 20th annual Filet of Solo Storytelling Festival. And uh, this is through the end of the month. Julie, tell us a little bit about this adventure you do every year, bringing storytellers from near and far into Rogers Park. Well, Filet of Solo uh, was actually founded by Sharon Evans at Live Bake Theater back in 1985. And when Live Bake closed their doors in 2008, Sharon really wanted the Filet of Solo Festival to be able to continue, and uh, we began producing it at Lifeline. And it is a collection of storytelling solo performers, but also uh, live lit collectives that come together and do hour long performances for three weekends in two venues in Rogers Park. And it has been wildly successful. It's a very unique kind of festival, and we've really, over the years, found a strong following for this particular kind of work. So who are some of your headliners who haven't already performed last week? Um, the Kates. Well, generally the way our programming works is that each group performs once um, on each of the three weekends so that you can get a chance to see absolutely everything if you want to That's we have a festival pass uh, but we have the Kates these are these are storytelling groups um, where you're going to see a lineup of a, of, of a couple of people um, you're being ridiculous gay Co the lifeline storytelling project sweat girls who are always always in the festival and then we have some solo performers Nestor Gomez has a new solo show that he's doing. Kevin Crispin has a new solo show directed by Lauren Sivak. And um, so there's an, an enormous variety of the sort of tellings that you're going to hear. If some of our listeners haven't been to a storytelling festival, what kind of stories are the people you just mentioned they're doing? Well, all of the work in Filet of Solo is first-person narrative storytelling. So there has just been an explosion of appreciation and participation in this art form in Chicago in the last couple of years. There are so many collectives. On any given night of the week, you can go out and either participate in or hear first-person narrative storytelling. And that is, that's the form that uh, you're going to hear in Filet of Solo. But, so it's an intensely personal form, but because we get a very diverse group of performers coming in talking about what it's like to have this experience or what it's like to walk around in my skin for a period of time, we get an enormous variety of stories and points of view in the festival. And that's a big goal, is, is to really get diversity of story and age and background so that you can go to see all of these different shows and have a completely different and unique experience at each show. In this internet digital age where there's all this content, why is storytelling, particularly live, made a comeback? Is that this American life's influence on us? Or is I, it the one-on-one? -on -one? I mean, what, why, why do you think storytelling is taking off again? Well, I, I think that we, you know, now that the moth is broadcast nationally, we hear that. There are storytelling collectives in Chicago that have been around for a while that are getting more and more spotlight on them. But I think it is the intimacy of the form uh, that perhaps in, in all of the other ways that we're communicating and all of the digital platforms that we participate in, which are, are wonderful, I think that this very intimate way of hearing somebody else's story is really resonating with us at this particular time. I think it's, it's a, a void that maybe has been created by the other ways that we now get our story. And, and um, so I, th I think that one of the reasons that it's taken off is that it does feel very intimate. And it's also a very accessible art form. So I, I, I think that's why we find that 
it's um, it's just well attended everywhere in the city all the time, and, and this festival takes off and becomes more robust every year. I would think that uh, a lot of people who are listening to you talk about storytelling could think, well, I could get in on that. I mean, it's something that a lot of people could do. Um, it is something that a lot of people can do, and I think that it's, um, you know, I think there's been a big resurgence in this idea of art as something everyone can do, uh, whether it's through the Old Town School of Folk Music, right? Like, pick up that instrument that you haven't done in a while. The idea of storytelling is very accessible in that particular way. Um, everyone, everyone has a story to tell. and. The only difference is whether you know you have a story to tell or not, right? But there, uh, there are lots of ways to get involved in it. There are classes. There are um, even just hearing storytelling. Um, a lot of the events that go on also offer a component where you turn to your neighbor and tell your own story. And um, I think it's something that people are hungry to participate in because it, it does not feel threatening. Julie, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on at Lifeline in the theatrical realm? You've got some productions coming up that you would like to tell us about. We do. Uh, we just opened one of our kids' series shows. You know, uh, Lifeline does three subscription series, adult plays every year, and then we do three kids' series productions. We've just opened our second kids' series show of the season. It's a brand new play called Fabulous, uh, written by Chris Hainsworth. And it's an adaptation of some of Aesop's fables. Uh, and it's very funny, and it has a lot of heart. You know, I love Aesop's fables, but it, they don't necessarily hit you in the heart. And so in that particular way, the stories have been um, kind of uh, improved in that way. The, the play is uh, running on weekends. And then, of course, we have school matinees. But it's a wonderful production. All of the shows that we do at Lifeline are adaptations of literary works. Um, our next subscription series show that's going to open is A Wrinkle in Time. I was very intrigued with this one. Mm -hmm. You know, we love young adult literature mm -hmm. at Lifeline. We don't get a lot of opportunities to produce those particular um, kinds of shows. But we were really excited to take this classic and reimagine it. And um, so we will be opening that in February, or actually March, beginning of March, and running that in the, in the evenings, but also providing some school matinees because there's a demand for it. Um, Shakespeare in May? What? Uh, Shakespeare in May. In May, we're actually doing. Um, I thought it was a Shakespeare theme that you were adapting, but I may be totally wrong about that. But that's in May. Yes. Yes. Um, exactly. Not worry about that. But, but talk a little bit about this adaptation process off of other stories. Well. Uh, How does that happen? Who decides on that's a good story, and then who gets the screenplay for it or the the, the script work? The. Artistic Ensemble at Lifeline is the engine behind all of the work that we produce. And so the Artistic Ensemble has ideas about books that they would like to see adapted, that they would be excited about working on, and so there is always a long list of books that the Artistic Ensemble are reading and considering, and then different members of the ensemble will pitch um, an idea for an adaptation, and those are considered, we decide on our season uh, more than a year in advance, and then sometimes the development of those scripts uh, will take up to a year or more. I think the unique thing that happens at Lifeline is not just that we're adapting these literary works into very successful theatrical productions, but the way that we do it is very collaborative. The artistic ensemble has input and gives feedback as these shows are being produced. So I may be, uh, uh, um, you know, Rob Kozlarik might be the adapter on a particular show, but the artistic ensemble is watching the workshops, participating in some of the readings, and being able to give their feedback. And after 30 years, we have a pretty good process and a pretty good safety net 
to shepherd adapters um, into being able to give birth to really exciting adaptations and productions. You know, one of the other things uh, that Lifeline has done for a long time and has always been impressive is they go into the public schools mm -hmm. and they run some programs and put on some performances, etc. How about sharing a little bit of that with our listeners? Lifeline has been working uh, specifically in the Rogers Park schools for um, uh, 20 years or so and we do residencies fully funded residency. So we receive the funding, we go out and get the funding to be able to provide drama residencies in the Chicago Public Schools at no cost to the school. We have been working in Jordan Elementary, New Field, Kilmer, these Rogers Park schools for years and years. We also do programming outside of Rogers Park. But it is a really important, uh, it's one of the very important roots that we have into the Rogers Park community. We are the first contact with theater for some of the students that we work with. At the same time, we have families that have been subscribers to Lifeline for years and have seen all of the kids' series shows that we've done. So it's, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a nice variety of residents that we touch. These residencies that we do in schools employ, you know, we have a, a, a team of teaching artists, 15 or 16 teaching artists that go and do this work and we have very strong relationships with the Rogers Park schools um, that are really valuable to us, teachers that we've worked with year, year after year. Well, Julie Ganey, who's Education Director at Lifeline Theater, thanks so much for joining us today and giving us a little bit of insight into how you do what Lifeline does so well. And thanks for your contribution to the rest of the Rogers Park community. Um, truly a, a wonderful institution that I'm glad to have heard more about. You've been listening to Live from the Heartland on WLUW 88.7 FM. We want to thank our guests, Greg Hines, Charlie Myerson, Julie Ganey. Remind you, we'll have a wonderful show next week. And we want to thank Nolan Chin in the studio and Morgan for doing video work today and Lynn Norman Weiss and Katie Hogan for off marching, which Michael and I will join the thousands of others. We're going to go out with a newly commissioned song by Ann Hampton Calloway, simply called the Women's March Song.